thing that I'm interested in. You know, you hear a lot from people. You hear a lot. Um, you hear this common adage um, trotted out by people, especially successful people, people that are in the limelight. They often say, oh, haters and all that sort of stuff. Um, you never see like a... Le- Someone will say, you'll never see a high performer in someone's comments like trashing them right it's usually people that are you know on the sidelines watching you know from the outside looking in wanting to get involved and the only way they can they feel like they can get involved is to trash the so-called celebrity and then you get this idea that oh um, you know once you get in um or once to this one that's one thing you hear a lot of people say and then they also say oh once you get in once you make it you know suddenly everything will change yeah you will suddenly change a new person your work ethic will change you have a different perspective on life and you just attack things a bit different than what you did previously and i don't believe it either i think there is probably a huge community of aspiring actresses actors sports people personalities out there who have burner accounts or who have made up accounts fake accounts under you know um different names where they go on celebrities in their immediate circle people that they don't like who are in their kind of entertainment group circle because you know you can't publicly trash somebody else in the entertainment industry because essentially you might burn a bridge or you might get yourself blackboard so i'm pretty sure there's celebrities out there who trash their colleagues so to so 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 to say um on those social media platforms in order to kind of uh bring them down so that in their head it can boost their it can give them more opportunity to kind of come up which is obviously you know famine um it's a kind of uh, a famine mindset but you know there's some there's some maybe credence to that and on the other side i also think the idea that suddenly once you get the opportunity to shine and once you fi- finally get an in in the industry that suddenly all your bad behaviors and bad character traits and the things that have kind of inevitably led to this point where you're in your life at the moment will suddenly go away is false and one example of that is andy ruiz jr as you guys are aware andy joshua beat andy ruiz jr unanimously uh via decision and he effectively won all 12 rounds and you know displayed a complete boxing clinic i would say I was um, very surprised by the performance, but no, I wasn't very surprised. I was very impressed by the performance. I wasn't surprised by it. I told my friend beforehand when we would go watch it in a pub in Hackney Wick or in Hackney Central, sorry. I was of the assumption that because there was so much riding on this fight, even though I'm pretty sure if he would have lost, Andy Joshua's bank account wouldn't have suffered that much, but I don't think he's in it for the bank account. It seems like he's in it for the legacy. I think his legacy would have got tarnished somewhat. And the way boxing set up, the fact that we don't get the fights that we want when we want them, um, as opposed to UFC fights, I think if he would have lost again to Andrew Ruiz Jr., it would have just delayed um, his ultimate success. It would have just added a few more years into the timeline of him getting to where he wants to get to. So I don't think it would have negative, it negatively impacted him that bad, but I think in terms of his career trajectory, and maybe him personally in mental space, it would have maybe uh, affected him somewhat. But um, I also was under the assumption that Andy Joshua is a kind of person that doesn't need to be told twice certain things. I think he got taught a lesson in the first fight. He got told not to believe the hype. I think that's probably the turning point in his career in terms of not being uh, swayed either way by the court of public opinion, especially boxing experts, because boxing is a weird one. Unlike football, um, most of the boxing analysts that speak on TV or on YouTube channels are people that boxing fanatic people highly respect because they've got, you know, they've got skin in the game. They've been part of the process. They were managers. They were agents. um, They were boxers themselves amateur level professional level whatever it may be so they've got actual knowledge of it so that that is cool as opposed to maybe football where a lot of the ex-pundits especially the pundits who are ex-footballers don't seem like they actually enjoy watching football you know you only have to look at the esp nfc kind of crew a lot of the scottish guys on there tend to you know they kind of track most people who don't necessarily like watching football but it's the easiest thing that comes to them they don't really have any other option you know in life basically so they have to just commentate on games they hate or watch teams they don't really like too much or even players they don't really support too often but boxing is different in that way so i'd assume if you're an anti joshua and you lose andy ruiz jr and you hear all the professionals in your industry effectively telling you what to do and you don't do it it can maybe feel as if like you're writing your own death sentence but i'm glad he didn't listen i'm glad he kind of stuck by his trainer i'm glad he adopted um this approach to the fight he could have went in there with a chip on his shoulder with his ego tarnished to some extent and wanted to basically enact, enact revenge on him, right? And, and also set a marker down. But the most important thing, especially he knows when the boxing business was him to get his W back, right? The fact that he would have, if he would have had back-to-back losses, it's not really similar to UFC in that way at all. I think in boxing, the fact that he's got one loss in his record, in some people's eyes, will tarnish his record, which is ridiculous to say that. Because if you're in a division where everyone's good, 
you know, you might lose. So I don't think that was a big deal. So I don't think that would have been that big of a deal. But again, in boxing world, it might have been. Anyway, the whole point of this uh, ramble was to say that Andy Ruiz Jr. is an example that just because you've made it or just because you get the chance to make it doesn't mean you're going to suddenly change your bad behaviours. And I don't know if it's not, it's not been spoken about as often or as more as it probably should have, but Andy Ruiz Jr.'s confession after the fight when he lost and he said, oh, one of the reasons why he thinks he lost is because he didn't listen to his manager. He didn't listen to his coach who happens to be his dad and his trainer and stuff and his nutritionist to get into better shape ahead of the fight. He just went off the rails, started partying and eating loads. And I'm sitting there thinking, what in the fuck, 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 right? Um, he came into this fight 20 stone overweight than his previous fight. So the, whatever he fought Joshua at previously, he must have been 260. And he came at, into this fight against Joshua this, this time around at 280. And I knew it anyway because I remember watching the fight and thinking to myself, well, I even mentioned it to my friend actually, why is Ruiz Jr. still got his t-shirt on for? He's doing that classic fat boy thing where you don't like to take your t-shirt off until you start fighting, like which is insane. But I just, just in general, just imagine, imagine this is your, the biggest fight of your career, right? The fight that's going to, I say more so than the first fight, because the first fight he wouldn't have got that good of a split in terms of the money, the revenue, the gate and stuff, because he was uh, essentially, the you know, he came in last minute.com as cover because baby, Big Baby Miller got popped for a million drugs. Um, yeah, this fight is the one that really sets him up. The first one was just like a little, you know, a little taste of what's to come, but defense of the title, he wins again against Ru Joshua, you know, proves unanimously that he is the better fighter and then goes on to do whatever he wants after the fact. And then you decide to mess it up this way. Like, that's insane. I don't know, man. I'm just I'm just flabbergasted, really. I'm really taken aback by it. This is a quick video of him saying it um, via Hub right TV. There. Actually, let, let me pause this. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to play it now because oh, I didn't put the thing on properly. Did I? But let me see if I can play it. I need to put the... I'm not sure if it's going, it's going to work now, but hopefully it does. Mm, 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 mm. But this is him talking about it. I've seen training, and like I said, I don't want to have no excuses, but I know I'm going to work my ass off. And look, um, and, you know, if we would have went toe-to-toe, -to -toe, I think that's when I was connecting. But I know for the trilogy... I know I'm going to be a lot better, and it doesn't matter where it's at. If it's here, even better. You know, I want to redeem myself here in Saudi Arabia. How are you feeling physically after the fight? Are you okay? Like, are you? I don't understand why he thinks he's going to get a trilogy. I really don't get that. Like, why would he, why would he give you a trilogy fight? Like, there's no point. There's no need. Like, if anything, this fight proved. If if any yeah, if anything, this fight proved Joshua's point that it was a punch from the gods. Even though it was a bit of a, you know, better thing to say because he lost the fight, obviously. But Ruiz didn't get close. He clipped him a couple of times, but that was it. He didn't get close. Joshua delivered a complete boxing clinic, kept him away with a jab and essentially dominated the entire fight. Why would we want to see a third rematch? Unless, of course, boxing is ridiculous and they decide to do a trilogy because, you know, Boxing has never gives you a fight that you won. And I think um, Wilder and Fury are signed to separate contracts, right? Separate, like, exclusive deals with different promotion companies. So there's they're, they're tied up in that. So they can't necessarily fight anyone else, I don't think. So we might get the trilogy, but he's got an immediate uh, title defense, right? Uh, Andy Joshua, like a mandatory defense he has to fight. I think the Usyk dude, he's got to fight really soon. Again, I'm no expert. I'm just kind of been following this for as a general public, as a general audience member. But... I just don't understand this. I really don't get it. I really don't. Your injury is all right. Just wanted to check on it. Yeah, you. I'm okay besides the the cut that I have. You know, I'm just a little disappointed. And me and my dad and my team were talking that I should that I should have listened to them. And, you know, I shouldn't have put on all this weight. I, I try to I try to kind of do my the training on my own, you know. And imagine how insane that must sound to somebody. Andy Ruiz Jr., the guy, like, now, now, now everything makes sense. If you hadn't heard of him previously, now you know why. He essentially self-sabotages and doesn't really take stuff seriously, even though he's obviously insanely talented at the, at the sport that he's chosen, which is boxing, which he's been doing since he's, what, five years old or some shit, right? He's coming into the, one of the biggest fights of his life. The first time around, he won, unexpectedly. But instead of just copying what he did the first time around and improving on it, he decides to throw out that, that manual, throw out that handbook, and just do it on his own. I'm just going to do it my way. What's your way mean? What, eat like a million tacos and then run a couple of miles? That is insane. That level of like 
carelessness is just crazy to me but again it goes to show that adage that people say oh once you get in once you get in the industry once someone gives you a look or once once you get given a, a cosign all of a sudden you're going to change your ways no no the way you approach a boxing fight in a sports hall somewhere in the middle of nowhere town getting paid your ticket your your bloody meal ticket there and maybe petrol money is the same way you're going to approach a big fight in saudi arabia i, I don't care it is it's the same thing the same way I'd approach a DJ bar gig in the middle of some, you know, random bar somewhere that no one's going to, that is completely empty, is the same way that I'm going to approach a DJ gig when I eventually go play at Printworks. It's the same way. If I'm diligent in the smaller things, I'm going to be even more diligent when it comes to bigger things because I know how quickly, how I know where I've come from and I know how quickly it is I can suddenly go back there again after a few duddy fights. And boxing's the same as any entertainment industry is. If he decides to pull in a few more of these performances where he comes in shockingly overweight, he can't take off his top during open workouts. He looks like a you know a guy you see in a in a local pub. And I, I don't and I, I don't care. The truth of the matter is, when you're watching sports, you're watching an elite level of uh, combat. You want to see the best physical specimens in front of you in front of TV. That's just what it is. I'm sorry, you can't have a person looking like that. It's not even Mark Hunt looking where he just looks stocky. He just looks completely fat. He's a beast. And he comes into a fight looking like that, wanting to fight someone like an Auntie Joshua who has spent the last few months trying to understand why he lost. He's been going through in his head mentally, replaying that loss in his head again and again and again. And Auntie Joshua, who's a, complete, a really stocky guy, somehow was able to lose 20 pounds of muscle and came in the leanest he's ever looked in a while. And yet you do this. And I, I've, I, I'm sorry, man. You know, I'm sorry to my dad. I should have listened to them more, you know. I think I got too confident on myself. And like I said, there's no excuses. He won. I won one. And I know for the third one, I'm going to be a lot better. No one's going to give you a third fight. But also, it's a, it's a cautionary tale, isn't it? It goes to show you, it is a cautionary tale when they say, I want you to get to, the hardest thing is staying at the top. The hardest thing is being a champion. The hardest thing is maintaining an unbeaten record because everyone's sniping at you. And you have to maintain a standard that's, especially if you're like a, that's probably why John Jones suffers so much in his career outside outside the octagon, outside the octagon, inside the octagon. He's been clearly so much better than everyone else that he's come across in his last few fights, with the exception of maybe Gustafson won. He's been so much. He's been light years ahead of everybody. Um, he basically can beat everyone in their sleep. He faced, you know, what was that Thiago Santos? You know, he could have taken Thiago Santos down any time he wanted, but instead chose to fight him standing up, even though Thiago Santos had one leg. Right? He's 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 been so dominant so good for so long that it's it's not crazy to think that he might be a little bit reckless and might take not take things that seriously sometimes you know he might end up doing you know blow off a stripper's ass before a fight not training before a lead up to a big title fight and just turn up and still molly what people i get it but andy ruiz is not the same you're not on once in a lifetime talent you obviously haven't proved yourself that level. This is why you were given a last-minute shot out of the blue with Ant against Anthony Joshua, which you probably didn't deserve on the strength of your record. And then you get a second opportunity to cement your legacy, to really, really, like, if you thought... And that's the thing, you have to think about it. If the first bit of money was, like, 7 mil, which after taxes and paying your trainers doesn't leave you that much, especially living the, especially living the way he lived, he went and bought cars. I remember seeing a picture of him, he bought cars and bought, like... I was just thinking this guy's insane. He bought his mum a couple of houses or one house, whatever it may be. That money runs out quickly. It's the second, it's the second go around that really is going to sustain the wealth of your family for generations to come because you would have learned some lessons from the first batch of money. So if he was to get seven this time around, then he got a 13 guaranteed second time around. That would have then meant his next few fights after that would be at a certain level, regardless. It'll be minimum 10 mil upwards. That's when you're you really cement your parent, your family's legacy and the sponsors start coming out the woodworks because they know you've got a title defense under your belt. You're going to be around with a title for maybe a year or two. And he threw that all away. For what? For what? A couple couple glasses of rum? Be back here. When did you know in camp that you hadn't trained enough? Was there a point where you said to myself, man, it's too late now and I should have trained more? <laughs> there was. Yeah, when you, you woke know, up. And I think we started too late. And we, we. I don't want to say the, the three months of partying or of that I had celebrating and, and whatnot kind of. Okay, let's be fair. He won, he, he won against Anti Joshua, a freak of an athlete, the icon of the UK. Cool, no problem. You're allowed a week. You're allowed two weeks. Maybe even three. Okay, I'll give you a month. 
three months of partying and celebrating three months that's why I like football. I like other sports where they win a championship and either the coach decides they just start again tomorrow, like nothing happened, they just start again. You just go and train on Monday morning. Or if you did win a big game on a Sunday, a cup final, whatever it means, like um, Scott, um, Rangers v Celtic, the boss gives you a one day off. You get the Monday off, right? To go and have a couple of drinks, um, celebrate with your family, celebrate with your teammates and then, you know, go to bed and come to training on Tuesday morning. Cool. But three months, three months of celebrating ahead of one of the biggest fights of your life. Because he could just disappear after this. He might end up fighting Ortiz. That would be cool. But or, or Wilder might want to take him apart to prove a point. But he could disappear after this. And then what? Affect me because it's either true they kind of did. And, but what can I say? Just learn, learn this mistake and... I'm glad I learned it now. I don't support him. It's not a mistake to learn at this level. I don't support this guy, man. I think he's a waste of space. I don't support it. Any, any, uh, I think at that level of excellence, at that level of performance, you have to bring the, you have to bring the pressure. You have to bring the pain. You have to bring the commitment. You have to bring the heart. Like it's just it's so disappointing to see. Imagine I'm just thinking about it. Imagine all these years of me DJing in my living room, DJing in random bars and pubs that no one cares about, right? Doing my thing, grinding, uploading mixes on fucking SoundCloud, getting one play, two plays, a hundred plays, a thousand plays, whatever it may be. And then suddenly, over a period of 18 months, I suddenly blow up overnight, quote unquote. I get opportunity to go play with some of my favorite clubs, Fold, XOYO, The Cause, Printworks, Mix Garage, The Yard. I go and play at some of my favorite places. Someone sees me, I get signed to an agency, I get booked to go play at Junction 2, Deck Mantle, a boiler room appearance. Imagine those things happen, and then that one opportunity I get to go actually take my stuff to the next level, I turn up high. I turn up and I haven't mixed for like seven, seven months prior to it. I haven't bought any new tunes. I've not been watching other DJs. I've not been listening to new albums. Imagine. That's ridiculous. Like, honestly, it's so, like, heartbreaking to see somebody have that level of opportunity and just throw it all away. For what? To party with people who didn't care about you before you were this successful? That's the problem. All these hangers-on that he got because he had a belt were there specifically because of the belt. He's going to wake up the next day and realize how lonely he actually really is, the real level of friendship that he has. Because the friends that were with you when you were a dusty dude before the Joshua fight are still going to be there. But the friends that suddenly laptop jumped onto you when you bought a bunch of white cars and you started dressing weird. Which is a direct contrast to Andrew Joshua, who's probably, you know, a lot more wealthier than Ruiz, but spent the entire training camp without a haircut. Looked like, you know, he hadn't slept in 11 days, was training every single minute of the day and comp remained completely stoic throughout the whole process. Even when he won, he was like, look, I'm not going to over celebrate because I should have done this in the first fight. That's why I love the guy, because we have the same mentality. Like, it's not that big of a deal. I should already be here. So I'm just going to perform the way I know how I can perform. Do my thing and go. It's not, I'm not building this up as this, it's a make or break moment. No, no, no. I've been working for this moment my whole entire life. I messed up that first fight. Now I'm going to reclaim my, my, my rightful position. Whew. I don't know, man.